My name is Ron Klein. I'm chair of JDCA. We'd like to thank you all for joining our call today with Senator Jackie Rosen, hosted by the Jewish Democratic Council of America. In the nearly three years since our founding, JDCA has established itself as the national voice of Jewish Democrats, advocating for Jewish and democratic values, such as expanding voting rights, expanding access to affordable health care, and combating the rise of anti-Semitism. Several weeks ago, JDCA launched the Democrats Leading in Crisis call series, amplifying the voices of Democrats leading amid the crisis. Each week, we have brought together members of Congress, experts, and hundreds of you to create a dialogue about important issues that you care about. During the month of May, Jewish American Heritage Month, we are highlighting these elected officials like Senator Rosen, who have been champions for our Jewish values in Congress. Senator Rosen is joining us today to discuss her efforts in leading the Senate to combat rising anti-Semitism. We are proud to support Senator Rosen because she gives voice to our values and we are happy to involve all of you in the conversation. Senator Rosen will be taking your questions after her remarks, so please send your questions to info at jewishdems.org. That's info at jewishdems.org. You can also post your question in the chat area of Zoom. Finally, we want to invite you to join the conversation on Twitter by tweeting us at at usjewishdems and using the hashtag jewishdemsinaction. Now I'm going to turn it over to JDCA's political chair, Izzy Klein. Izzy? Thanks, Ron. I'm so proud to introduce Senator Jackie Rosen, representing the great state of Nevada. Before being elected to the Senate, Senator Rosen represented Nevada's third district in the House. In the 2018 cycle, she was JDCA's first Senate endorsement. Her election made Nevada the seventh state to elect two women to the Senate, where she sits on the Health, Commerce, Homeland Security, and Small Business Committees. A full plate. Importantly, Senator Rosen also found time to start and co-chair the Bipartisan Task Force on Anti-Semitism, which has led numerous bipartisan initiatives to fight this growing threat facing our community. Senator Rosen is the only former synagogue president in Congress, and she is a remarkable leader on this important issue in the U.S. Senate. We're grateful to hear from her today, and we're grateful for her team. As a reminder, please send your questions to info at jewishdems.org, and our executive director, Haley Soyfair, will get to them. Over to you, Senator Rosen. Well, thank you, Izzy, Ron, Haley. I just can't thank you all enough for the work that you're doing, um, inviting everyone here uh, to speak in this new, new way as we go through all of this with COVID, but just everything you've been doing since you founded uh, JDCA. It's so important and I am uh, so very grateful. Uh, but before I go further, I do have to say this to everyone on the call. I hope that wherever you are, your friends, your family, the ones that you love are safe, they're healthy. Um, we all know that the only things you can't replace in life are the ones you love. And so I want to be sure that we say that and we'll continue to do that. Um, fight for that legislatively and personally. And so here we are, it's Jewish Heritage Month, you're right. And uh, um, I know we'd rather be together in person. I'd rather give all of you great big hugs, but since we can't do that, we're here in spirit and visually. And I am honored to serve as Nevada's newest Senator, hold the distinction of being the third Jewish woman in the United States Senate. And actually, and I call it a blessing, not everyone may, but uh, I was, uh, the past president of my synagogue that was very near and dear to my heart and was the biggest blessing of my life and taught me many values that I uh, carry with me uh, every single day as I try to legislate in a, a timely, targeted, and thoughtful manner. And so, um, you know, we're blessed to be here today and we're blessed to serve our communities. We're blessed to give back, whether we're doing it in a philanthropy role, whether we're doing it in a legislative role, we're gonna to continue to fight on every single front because effective public service, whatever role you're in, however you choose to lead, is about listening, 
particularly as legislator, legislators, we really know um, that we have to hear our constituencies within our state, within our AFARM, our allies and partners, because we carry those stories with us. These are the stories I tell when I'm in a hearing, when I'm fighting for legislation. I carry the stories of others. That is my role. It inspires me and helps me know what I'm fighting for. And so, of course, uh, three years ago, or nearly four years ago, I got elected in 2016 to Congress, 2018 to the Senate. I don't have to tell any of you the rise in anti-Semitism since 2016. You can see every chart, ADL, this one, that one, all of it. I'm on Homeland Security. Uh, it is alarming. I, I decided to take action by being the uh, first person ever in the United States Senate to form a bipartisan task force solely for the purpose of combating anti-Semitism. Hadn't been done before. James Langford uh, from Oklahoma is my co-chair. He works a lot on religious freedom across the world. And I thought that he would be a good Republican partner with me. Right now we have 38 members. I like to say we join like Noah's Ark, two by two, a Democrat and a Republican. You come with a partner or you wait and tr we try to pair you up. So no one can take this and say it's all D's or R's. This is not about that. It is bipartisan. It is about combating hatred. And so we've seen a lot of uh, rise in anti-Semitism from uh, not just in America, but across Europe, uh, Ukraine. We had some issues just in the last few weeks. We can talk about that, but within political parties, um, anti-Semitic groups, they've expanded their influence online and people who once hid these dangerous views no longer feel the need to hide. And so we can't hide either. That's why it's important that you're there and I'm here, that we form this task force, that we stand up. They're coming out. We have to stand up boldly to combat them. And so, you know, whether the violence here in America is from Charlottesville to Poway to Pittsburgh, uh, every city and town, synagogue in between, um, we all can tell the stories of the hate crimes here in America. Um, particularly with the coronavirus, we've seen issues in New York, the pandemic fear, things that have happened with shivas and funerals and in some of our more orthodox communities. Uh, so much going on and people continuing with anti-Semitic tropes uh, dating back to the plague about Jews bringing um, um, the plague to Europe. And this is leading to more acts of hate. It's leading to more acts of violence. So right now, even more than ever, we have a responsibility to our neighbors, to our friends, to our community, to our children to fight and prevent anti-Semitism before it starts. I believe a big function of my task force is to educate, to explain, and to empower. And so um, one of the things in 2018 that I was proud to do as a member of the House, I fought to uh, ensure uh, that the State Department, that our special uh, envoy to combat anti-Semitism, I know you all know him, Elon Carr, um, we, we wanted to appoint someone to do that. We're trying to get legislation to rise, raise this up, make it a permanent position, not one that goes with the whim of any administration. It really has teeth, it has a staff, it can do its work, it should be the level of an ambassador, and we can work with them in Congress, the executive branch, and other um, allies and partners around the world work with this ambassador uh, to combat anti-Semitism. So um, we, I got some bipartisan legislation out there with Senator Gillibrand, uh, backed by more than a quarter of the Senate. We hope that we can get some traction on that to elevate that role. And really, um, it's really important that we do all of this in a bipartisan way. And just this month, I know all of you know this, it's just about to be signed into law, our Never Again Education Act. Overwhelmingly passed the House and passed by unanimous consent in the Senate. To, has gone to the president's desk. I believe it should be signed into law this week. Um, that was a huge win, particularly for uh, Jewish Heritage Month, but it's going to establish dedicated federal funding through the U.S. Holocaust Museum to promote and train music, uh, uh, t teachers uh, for hol with Holocaust education. So it's not just willy-nilly where people decide to say what they want to do in their school districts. This is going to be real uh, curriculum that um, speaks the truth, that opens up dialogue, that opens up conversations, that um, 
educates, informs, and I hope inspires people to be better. It is a first step. I am very, very proud of it. Um, in February, we introduced bipartisan resolution commemorating the 75th liberation of Auschwitz, again, unanimously passed by the Senate. Um, we're, pur we're purposely, uh, Senator Langford and I, trying to tackle these issues um, in a bipartisan way. You're going to see more of that. And, um, you know, make no mistake, these are challenging times. But in times of great darkness, and we've seen that as a Jewish community throughout history, um, we have to dig deep. We have to find our strength. We have to tell our stories. Um, and we have to find a way uh, to use our faith and hold up our values as a source of light. I think about the Holocaust. I was speaking with some friends this weekend from my synagogue, and somehow we were talking about recipes. And someone had brought out a book of recipes that, that people had thought about in the Holocaust. And I have this book called In Memories, I think it's Memories Kitchen, and how in the darkest times in concentration camps, our ancestors thought about the things that were important to them, their values, the recipes, the food, the holidays, whatever that bound them together. Through this pandemic, through these levels of anti-Semitism and what's happening, we have to find those same shared values and memories, find strength and bring them into the light. And so, um, you know how I feel about tikkun olam, it is each and every one of our duty to repair our corner of the world. This is how we do it, one step at a time how we care for each other, how we fight for organizations, how we work together as allies, and it's not a political issue. It's not D or R, it's not man or woman, it's not gay or strict, it's not this or that, it is all of that, because hate, like this virus, uh, it does discriminate, but it knows no boundaries, so we have to pull together on that. And um, that's what I'm gonna do, I am appreciate being your partner, and we're just going to continue the fight step by step, and we're going to try to take every bit of darkness, every bit of um, attack against us, and turn that around. I'm a former computer programmer. I want to turn that equation on its head and use it in a different way, and that's what we're going to do, and that's how we're going to move forward, and I can't do it alone. We're going to all do it together, so with that, I guess I'll take a few questions, and uh, we'll go from there. Great. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, you know, we, we love the fact that you are a former synagogue president, the first elected to the Senate. <laughs> and uh, as you reflect on that experience and now your four years in Congress, how is being a synagogue president different from being a U.S. Senator? And what lessons did you learn from your leadership of your community and your synagogue that prepared you for public office? You know, it, it's a great question. I get that question a lot. And I will tell you that it was um, a great preparation because um, what you have to, what you learn is you have um, a diverse community. You have old and young and people on education. People are, they have their life cycles and weddings. And, and it's all about the things that are most important to them, their core values. This is my baby's being born. My grandmother's dying, I, I want a bar mitzvah, it's all these life cycles, the joys and the sorrows, someone has cancer, a divorce. So you learn that everyone wants to be together because um, you share these values and that everyone matters and the most important thing you can do is listen. You can't always fix everything, but you can be present and you can listen and you can hold a hand. It's what I learned as temple president. And so now that I'm a legislator, I can do more than just listen. Sometimes we can make legislation can, and we can do something. We can use our bully pulpit here to educate, to illuminate, to inform, <clears throat> to pass legislation where we can. And if we can't, hold someone's feet to the fire by shouting out about why won't you do this. And so I think it's really important to people say you're, is it better to be in the majority or the minority? Each has its probably pros and cons, but here in the minority, I get to, for sure, tell people, why won't you do this? And, and, and even in the majority, you get to shine that light. And that's what we get to do. It all matters. You listen to the stories. You carry them with you. It motivates you. And I think that's the biggest thing that I learned was how to really um, um, hear 
I guess, really hear what mattered to people and uh, move that in some way forward to give them something that was important in, in my role, same way I do now. Thank you. Um, I, I love what you said about uh, the importance of uh, bipartisanship and the similarity to be, being like Noah's Ark. Uh, because it, obviously to get to really pass legislation, it has to be, uh, it does have to be bipartisan and it's so important in this time. But are there limits to bipartisanship when it comes to combating anti-Semitism, specifically calling out the actions and rhetoric of the President of the United States, which has directly contributed to our rising insecurity? Do you find that when it comes to pointing a finger in the direction of the White House, your Republican colleagues are hesitant to do so. So, you know, that is a question I get asked a lot too. And so my motto is agree where you can and fight where you must. So with all of our colleagues, uh, my colleagues on the other side, maybe not all of them, but there are many issues that we have in common and some things that we don't. And so in order to legislate and move things forward, I try with each one to meet them where they are on things that we agree on. But what's important when you talk about hate, whether it's anti-Semitism or other forms of bigotry, that you're consistent. So whether it's the president or someone else, I'm not gonna tolerate anti-Semitic tropes, particularly in COVID when it, I guess people are bringing out these old tropes, things are happening all across, around the world. So whether it's the president someone in my own party or the other party, I'm going to be consistent in that. I'm going to agree with people and work with them everywhere we agree. And I'm going to hold their feet to the fire when we don't. So I don't have an issue with that. I think it's how we have to navigate legislating, um, understanding that I, I like to use the term, my husband loves lima beans and I, for this story, and I do not like lima beans, but Sometimes there's lima beans in my house. And sometimes I make lima beans, sometimes I, there's no lima beans. To, but I don't, I, don't not, I don't run off and divorce my husband because he likes lima beans and I don't. Uh, it's often on our uh, dinner table. And that's how I look uh, with my colleagues. I try to find those places where we agree um, because that's what people expect. That's what real leaders do. Move as much forward as you can and then stand up for what um, the other things where you might have the big disagreements. Thank you. Well, on, on a similar note, we've had a few questions um, that, are, that are similar, so I'll, I'll group them together. Um, this one comes from Cantor, Joseph Goyle, uh, Jonathan Wolf, and William Berger. Uh, they all ask different iterations, but how do you address the anti-Semitism that exists on the extreme right and the extreme left? Uh, specifically in the Senate, and, and this might be yet another lima bean kind of question, uh, but how do you take it when it, when it exists perhaps uh, on different extremes um, on both sides? Well, you know, I, I thank you for the question, and I tell you in the, in the same way. So people, um, I like to think about uh, Twitter and uh, social media in a way. Imagine that if uh, you were walking through a hallway and everyone there had garbage bags full of ping pong balls and they were throwing them at you all day. All you'd be doing is, now that doesn't look very good on the camera, all you'd be doing is trying to deflect. You might grab one or two, but you would never get anything done. So what I've chosen to do is I know there's people on the right, there's people on the left in my own party, not from my party. I'm going to react where it's important, but I'm not gonna let them define me or my agenda. So if I spend all day long catching ping pong balls, I wouldn't have been able to form my task force. So I'm choosing to be proactive, to say I form this task force, this is my agenda, this is our agenda, this is what we're gonna work on. I'm gonna to respond to them where I can, but I'm gonna use my energy and my resources to continue to bring people in and build my path forward, which I think will is the right path will bring people and bring a coalition. Not saying I'm not gonna to react to them, but I'm not gonna let them define the conversation. So when I do my task force, when we do statements, when we pass legislation, I'm creating a positive narrative moving forward for people to join on, not just criticize, join on, advocate, illuminate, legislate where we need to, Etc. Etc. So that's how I'm choosing to do it, and this proactive as opposed to reactive, 
but understanding that I do need to react, but if I spent all day, what else would I do? And not just anti-Semitism, probably anything anymore on Twitter, right? You would just spend all day doing nothing else. So I'm, I'm choosing to um, let my work be my path forward. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Cindy. An effective way to combat anti-Semitism is to get the president out of office. Part of doing this is ensuring a safe election through vote by mail and ensuring the post office is actually funded and functioning. How can Americans pressure Republican senators to allow the Senate to vote to fund vote by mail and the post office? And on a related note, I know that President Trump recently threatened funding for Nevada over access to vote by mail. So if you could please speak about that and how it's affecting your state. Well, the president can't threaten to hold funding from any state. And the president uh, is like on many other matters, not, not quite as informed as, uh, as he should be or as he uh, chooses. He's only as informed as he chooses to be. I'll, I'll just leave it right there because we could spend all day talking about the president and his opinions. But the post office, I will tell you that over 35 states have vote by mail. Republican state, Utah, vote by mail. Florida, I mean, you could go on and on. I can tell you, I think it's about 38 states. I know it's well over 35 have some form of vote by mail. Many states have all vote by mail. So he better be careful what he talks about. He's not educated in this way. People are used to it, people like it. I think going forward in Nevada, we need multi, uh, we have a multiple, multiple ways that we vote. We have very robust early voting. 10 days of early vote, about 60% of people early vote were really used to it in Nevada. It is wide, it is open. We have vote by mail. And of course we have day of voting. I think with COVID we're, we're having an all vote by mail primary. We're working on that. We have a Republican Secretary of State. Uh, she's been putting out PSAs and, and, and the like, explaining to people about vote by mail. It is what people want. I don't think um, the president can, he, we're not gonna stop him from saying what we're saying. Some of the fight is within our states. When you talk to people, uh, uh, this is where our state parties, and specifically in Nevada, but, but I would say every state party, these are the fights of our state parties to be sure that the secretaries of state, we hold their feet to the fire to be sure that there's not voter suppression, that the voter rolls are good, that people can register. There's plenty of sites. Those are the roles our state parties, our local democratic um, groups work on, of course, along with allies and partners who help support that broadly. Each and every state has their issues, good or bad. Um, we do need to fund the post office for many reasons. A post office is in the Constitution. Uh, I can't uh, tell you what the post office needs, needs to be here, needs to stay, needs to be funded. That's another issue. But I would say that, um, again, we have to just work with our allies and partners in each and every state, with our Democratic state parties, with those groups who are fighting for voter, um, uh, voter rights and uh, fighting against voter suppression. There's quite a few out there uh, and do everything we can to ensure that this election is free and fair. We're doing our part um, in the Senate uh, working on that as well. Great. Uh, Linda Jimenez Glassman uh, is asking specifically about the Never Again Education Act, which uh, of course passed recently and provides essential funding for Holocaust education. Uh, given the state's role in setting uh, cur the curricula for ed public education, how does this bill address the fact that now additional Holocaust education will be added into such curricula? Yeah, I, I think this was a really great first step in centralizing good quality, uh, truthful, authentic, whatever words you want, curriculum to teach the Holocaust, to train teachers about how to do this, about to have these conversations. Because I think even more broadly, when you talk about the Holocaust and some of the press and hatred and all of that, you're gonna end up in some schools, it's gonna open questions of hatred and bigotry as things that are happening to these students now, happening in their communities now. And we have to train and empower teachers to and school counselors and the like to deal with those kinds of uh, conversations that uh, an education that's necessary when that comes up. So this was the first step to put a national uh, footprint on that. 
now I believe what the Holocaust Museum has to do and what we have to do is be sure that we reach out to um, our state legislatures across the country, informing them that this is here, that the, all they have to do is reach out to the Holocaust Museum, that they can provide you the curriculum, that they can provide you the training, that they can do those things, that it's there for you. So now it's incumbent upon us to be sure that the distribution uh, through the state legislatures, through our school districts, through different ways that we educate the community or the country broadly that this is there and that they can take advantage of it. And then I think that some states um, will also be working on their own state legislation where it applies, but now they have, we have a conduit to have this national conversation. And that was what was really important about this legislation. Great. Pamela Barway asks a very candid question that uh, I think many of us with children can relate to. Uh, what is your advice for a stressed out middle-aged mom with <laughs> regard to explaining the rise of anti-Semitism and the president's role specifically in that to her 12-year-old, a kid who is already stressed out about postponing his bar mitzvah until 2021? Well, I, you know, I have to tell you, this is very funny because uh, so this is where the senator and the Jewish mother uh, overlap, right? Or maybe the synagogue president, because a lot of my friends um, have either kids or grandkids about, who've had to postpone. We've been doing a lot of virtual, because uh, they've practiced, they've written that speech. Oh my God, they, they want to you know, be there on, on the bima. And so we've, we've been doing Zoom bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs in some way, and then they're just postponing the party. And it's been really great. We've let the kids come and uh, do Zoom services with us because they worked, anyone knows, they worked so hard for this moment and, and creating that speech and doing all that. And you, you don't want to put that on. And so we found a way at our synagogue to do that. I know a lot of other synagogues are doing that. But how do, you, how do we speak to our kids about... Um, I don't want to say tolerance, because tolerance means you tolerate. How do we speak to our kids? I want to think about, about kindness, about our Jewish values, about listening, about inclusion, about the kind of person that, that we want them to be. And so I, I think as we talk about hate, I, 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 was, at a, um, I was at a conference once, and, and a 12-year-old kid asked, asked, uh, a person, uh, the person who was giving the conference, you know, how, how do I be like you? I like what you do, and I don't like what this one does. And uh, the kid was about 12, brought by their parents. And, and what the person there said, this is what you should do. Find a person you admire. List the top five things that they do that you think are great. And find a person that you think is not so good. List the top five things that you don't like that they do. Be like the one you like and don't be like those things. And I think that that is kind of a way like how we model, how we emulate. I, I always say bring our kids uh, everywhere because how are they going to learn what's important to you? Um, it, you, can't, you can't send your kid to college if they never walked home from the bus. You've got to give them the experience of being at your knee, being in a meeting, being in a political route, whatever's important to you doing the social action, the food drive. We all know it from our synagogues, all the things we do, midst the day. Let them be present to see what's important to you. Talk with them about it and tell them to be like the things about the people they like and the things they don't like. It's don't do that and catch yourself when you do. And um, I think that that's a really good lesson for a lot of us. Great. Uh, our next question comes from Noah Lieben from New Jersey. As a former synagogue president, I imagine you have feelings about the president's declaration that houses of worship are essential. How do you recommend houses of worship in Nevada begin the process of opening up in a safe way? And how does this impact us uh, Jews uh, who are both anxious to go back to synagogue, but also recognize the need for social distancing? And of course are grateful for all the online resources that our synagogues have been providing. You know, I can tell you, I, I've been taking advantage of so many different online resources from not just my synagogue, but across, uh, uh, across a lot of the uh, Facebook groups and different things that, that I'm a part of. But I think what's important, and this is, 
um, you, you can say houses of worship open up. That's great. But all of us know, whether it's a synagogue, whether it's a church, a mosque, religious institutions work on, we, we all live, we live on charity, on donations, on our membership. Our memberships are hurting, many of them unemployed. Nevada has the highest unemployment rate in the country right now, over 28%. And with our hospitality base, that's not going to go away for a while. So opening up is oftentimes um, a matter of, for right now, oftentimes, but right now, and depending on the size of your congregation, regardless Jewish or not, you might have to hire new staff to do cleaning. You're going to have to pay to put extra sanitizer, pay to provide masks. How do you hire that staff to clean between uh, the, the, the pulpit, the pews? Do we use prayer books or buy whatever, whatever you might use in, like I said, whether it's a synagogue or a church? Do you take those away so people aren't touching them? Do you clean them in between? So it's a matter of resources. We don't often have an extra custodian or an extra person. We, we run kind of uh, <clears throat> run kind of lean, and so do many churches, of course, because you want to um, um, spend your money wisely. And so it's not a question of not wanting to open up. It's a question of how we do it safely so we don't spread the virus. So how do we keep our environment safe? Um, how do we keep our Sunday school safe? we got little kids. How are they running around, not running into each other? How do we space out those classrooms? Um, how do people, you know, the bar mitzvah kids, you know, they're holding the Torah. I mean, how do we do that? And so it's really a matter of practicality. And um, that's just going to take some time for people to build the resources and figure out what's right for their um, religious school, for their services, for their social groups, whether it's sisterhood or brotherhood or senior group or youth group. Um, we've got a million, you know, all have all, all the um, different groups that we support. And um, we just have to find that right way. And it's going to be different depending on the maybe physical environment of our congregation, right? So there, there is no one size fits all. But I do think that um, when I first signed on to services on Friday night on Facebook Live a few months when this started, um, and I saw my friends' names come up, and then I started texting them, I felt this amazing sense of community as I saw their names. And even though I was in Washington and they were here, and, Nevada, um, it lifted me up just to see those names come up. Um, it, and, and so um, don't think that it's not without value to have those virtual uh, touch points. Thank you for that. Uh, we have two questions related to Israel, so I'm, I'm going to combine them. Uh, Mishulam Unger in Maryland asks about your position with regard to possible Israeli annexation of parts of the West Bank. And separately, Ada has asked us to talk, or you to talk specifically about the nexus between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and when, uh, when criticism of Israel can veer into anti-Semitic speech. Yeah, those are both really great and, uh, and of course, uh, tough questions. But overall, we all know this, ensuring that Israel remains safe and secure, its democracy is safe and secure, it is of paramount importance to all of us. And so really to that end, we have to be sure that anything we do um, doesn't, um, doesn't de demote that uh, or, or collapse that. And so if we annex the West Bank, um, how is this going to how is this going to really move us forward and so we should never never ever in my opinion condition security assistance or our unbreakable bond with israel on annexation or on those other political policies doing so even suggesting so is not in israel's best interest it's not in the best interest of a negotiated two-state solution why is a negotiated two-state solution important? All of you know this, because if both parties don't have skin in the game, if they don't have buy-in, if they don't have agreement, it will never work. So we need to continue to work on those things. It's gonna facilitate that, it's gonna bring them to the table to work out the issues um, that they have. And uh, I just never, I never think it's appropriate to consider uh, 
to condition aid on that. You know, I've worked when I was in the house, one of the first uh, things I did, uh, I was on armed services. We got a missile defense system for Israel. That was bipartisan. I've been on a lot of other bills. We sanctioned um, the UN on, on, on some of those. The first thing I did when I got to the house. And so we have to just keep beating that drum. And we can't also let um, uh, anti-Zionism turn into, into anti-Semitism, to, to Ada's point. Um, you know, we have to be sure that we look at that uh, International Holocaust, um, that definition, the Inter International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, they have a definition of anti-Semitism. We need to uh, continue to speak about that. We can uh, talk about Israel in many different ways, but we can't, we can't let that devolve into anti-Semitism. And so we just have to be resolute. We have to be consistent in our message. Uh, to fight against anti-Semitic bigotry uh, wherever it uh, rears its ugly head. And I believe we have to continue to really fight for that negotiated uh, two-state solution and try not to put that in jeopardy and not condition it. Thank you. Uh, we're getting some follow-ups now. We have a follow-up from Linda with regard to the Never Again Education Act. Her question is, what if schools don't want to teach Holocaust or genocide education? Are there consequences stipulated in the bill uh, that require this? Well, what this does is it, it, it funds the Holocaust Museum um, for the next five years. Uh, it gives funding for them to develop, distribute, train, and, and these types of curriculum broadly throughout the country. And so uh, the sanctions are not in this particular bill. It is voluntary and that's where all of us come in. That's where we come in working with allies and partners with states or some states that uh, have it mandated, some don't, uh, some don't want to, but how do we work with our education departments throughout the country? How do we try to get this now, now that we have a central place for them to go get it, how do we broadly educate people that it's there, that this is what they should be using um, it's going to be different positions, probably in uh, different states because of the way their laws may be. Uh, some, like I said, some states have it mandated, others don't. Um, Nevada, I think we're, uh, I believe there are people trying to work on that. Uh, that's always a different issue about funding and unfunded mandates. So that's all within states' jurisdiction. But I think our goal now is to try to get this information out and um, work with it from there. It's just a first step. Great. Uh, we have some, some additional questions that are not specifically related to anti-Semitism, but of definitely of interest to the Jewish community. Uh, Dana Gordon from Chicago asked, yeah. how will the Senate protect dreamers if the Supreme Court will not? Well, you know, I, I have uh, one answer to that. It's November 3rd, right? So uh, until November 3rd, we have, to, uh, we have to do everything we can to keep fighting for the 800,000 or so dreamers. We also have uh, many uh, TPS workers, those temporary protected status, people that came from El Salvador and Haiti, from earthquakes, from violence. They've been here, many of them, greater than 15 years. They came here maybe as teenagers or young adults. Now they have families. We kept extending that. We have to be sure we protect them as well. So we're gonna continue to fight but the best thing that we can do, I can tell you this, and I'm gonna get on my soapbox here, is that if we don't change who has the gavel in the United States Senate, then we can't get our agendas across because that person who has the gavel right now is either gonna be the chief enabler or the chief obstructor. He was a chief obstructor under Obama, he's a chief enabler under Trump. And so we need to, flip the Senate so that we can find ways to protect our dreamers, protect TPS, to do many of the other things that we want to move forward. And he solely controls what comes to the floor in the Senate, all those judges, all the nominations, every bill, all of it. And so uh, this is our answer 160 some days, I think, to November. And we have to do every single thing that we can to remove him having that gavel. That's how we change the equation. 
So on a related note, uh, and in, in a related uh, area, Steve from Illinois asks, uh, some say that if Democrats, Democrats regain control of the Senate, Mitch McConnell will block everything by filibustering. If Democrats regain control, should they abolish the filibuster? Oh, you know, I think there's been a lot of filibustering about the filibuster. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I think, you know, in history and pundits, people think they would blow it up. We've blown it up. Harry Reid blew it. Should we blow it? There's all this conversation. I think what we have to do first is remove that gavel from his hands, and then we can really see what that means. How big of a win do we have? And then what do we need to do and how we need to do it? So um, I really believe that the most important thing is let's, let's flip that equation. Let's flip as many seats, take as many seats as we can, and then start working on our agenda moving forward and, we'll, and figure out what the right path is um, to do that. Great. And, and our last question, uh, which is related, is how, how can we help uh, most effectively to ensure that we take that gavel from his hand, that we remove Donald Trump from the White House and elect Joe Biden? Uh, what advice do you have for us concerned Jewish Democrats that want to impact the outcome of this election? Well, so there's a few things. So what is everyone, what are the three things that we need? Whether it's philanthropy or politics or work, people have time or they have work, wealth, and wisdom, right? Work, or some people say time, talent, and treasure, work, wealth, or wisdom, right? So if you have the wealth, you be sure that you give early, still early, but give to the end, give as much as you can, whether it's $5 or 5,000 or whatever that is for you, you give to the candidates, you give to those of us who may not be in cycle, we can potentiate what you do in ways that individuals can't. There's other uh, allies and partners like you guys, there's uh, issues that you might care about, the environment, this, that, or the other. Be sure that you give to the best of your ability with your wealth. Then, your work and your wisdom, where is that gonna be most valuable? So, in your communities, the work can be Maybe you host an event, you host a coffee, you do a canvas kickoff, you host a phone bank, you drive people to the polls. Where can what you do and help empower or enable someone else to get out the vote? To, maybe you have local candidates and you know something very much about a particular policy and they need an expert on there. How can you help them uh, learn and understand from you what's important for their role. We have offices from school board all the way up to president. Each one is important because they serve a different role in our community. So where does your work and your wisdom fit within your community to get out the boat, to empower your state parties or how, however it works within your communities. For us, it's Nevada State Party. Uh, it really is our coordinated campaign. That's the secret sauce in Nevada. It may be different in other states, but give your, uh, your wealth the best of your ability, and then give your work and your wisdom to the best of your ability. Um, like I said, call, phone calls, phone uh, canvassing, well now maybe it's virtual, writing postcards, writing letters, hosting events, um, calling your friends, whatever that is, and that's what we need. We need your work, your wealth, and your wisdom, and that's how we win. Thank you so much, Senator. I will now turn it back over to JDC's Chair Ron Klein to wrap up the call, but we're incredibly grateful for you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Ron, it looks like you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Sorry about that. Thanks for calling it out. Senator Rosen, I want to thank you for your leadership and your comments today. Very inspiring. Uh, having, when I was in the Florida legislature, I passed a bill requiring teaching of the Holocaust in Florida's public schools. Uh, and uh, it was one of the first states, New Jersey and Florida, that did it. But one of the challenges we had, which I know you, you're, you're going to be working on at the national level, is to make sure that the teachers are taught. Uh, you know, some of the worst damage we could do is, is not having the ability of these kids to learn from people who really are knowledgeable and understand. They can do more damage. It takes resources, it takes time, it takes creativity different places. So South Florida, for example, we have a large population of Jewish community that wants to participate. Other parts of Florida, just like in Nevada, you have 
mm-hmm. population experience, and we need to do that. So thank you for taking up on a 50-state uh, basis. It's so important today, and it will be in the future. Um, just wanted to uh, thank everybody for your participation today. This has been another uh, great session for our, uh, for our uh, uh, crisis uh, program. Um, we are going to have more. We have another program next week, which is on June 2nd at 3 p.m., which is it's going to be with Integrity First for America. They're the group that is suing the neo-Nazis who organized the protest in Charlottesville. And we're going to have a continued opportunity to hear more about the organized role of anti-Semitism, what can be done about it, both legally and in join us uh, for that event as well. Lastly, I just want to encourage you to please visit our website at jewishdems.org to support JDCA. You can make, uh, you can get involved in our in our programming, you can get involved in our advocacy, you can get involved financially, as you heard earlier about how to participate. And uh, those of you who are in states where we have chapters, which are some of our most active states where we have Senate races and congressional races and presidential electoral college races, we're organizing uh, and we want, we need your involvement. So please join us. Uh, We hope to see you again next Tuesday for our next call. And uh, between now and then, have a safe, healthy day. Thank you for your participation.